But thank you so much for joining us um, at this uh, event. We call it Brave New Humanities. It's kind of an investigation of the way in which new forms of technology, computational uh, linguistics, for instance, are, are adding to maybe a sense that humanities is in flux. So one of the kind of bigger uh, discussions that we'll have, particularly later on, um, is how do computational linguistics uh, and what we'll be talking about specific today, computational literary studies, the new tools and the technology, software, etc. how do they perhaps reinvigorate the humanities, how do they challenge the humanities, but also what are the possibilities and limits um, of those new tools. So uh, we're kind of discussing a, a burgeoning research field today. Um, this is this is why we're here. My name is uh, Professor Sebastian Hus. You may call me Baz. Uh, I work as a professor of English literature at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, my research centre, the Centre for Transnational and Transcultural Research, is hosting this afternoon. But this is also sponsored by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, which is a funding body in the humanities in the UK that is sponsoring funding uh, a project that I'm working on. And I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, in a second. We want to really welcome you for taking the time uh, to reflect on us on what computational literary studies it might mean, what it can do, and perhaps also, um, yeah, seeing where this may take us. This is what we're kind of discussing today with a very diverse panel with some of the pioneers in this area. We have Karina van Dalen Oskam, uh, a professor of computational literary science at the Huygens Institute in, in Holland. Uh, she's working in Amsterdam. We've got uh, another pioneer, uh, Professor Maciej Eda, who's the director of the Institute of Polish Language um, at the Polish Academy of Sciences. And his PhD student, Joanna Bijuk, is here as well. She's going to uh, tell us a, a bit more about multimodal statistics a bit later on. From the UK, from London, uh, at London's Birkbeck College, we've got Professor uh, Martin Paul Eve, who is Professor of Literature, Technology and Publishing at Birkbeck. Um, he's one of the pioneers really uh, in, in the UK, looking at digital humanities and open access publishing. Uh, we're really, really glad that he's able to be here today. We also have my colleague at Wolverhampton, uh, Dr. Emet Mohammed, who is a senior lecturer in computational uh, linguistics in the uh, research group uh, RILP at my um, institution. Um, we've got a packed program. So what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about where I come from as a person who has come really from, from traditional, uh, in a traditional English literature, literary background and see where um, I see this stuff at him. Be before we do that, um, a couple of things, uh, housekeeping uh, notes. We are recording this session, uh, just so you're aware of that. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And what we're doing today um, is to have a series of presentations by our panel, about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, they're going to talk about the tools that they use, about some of the software that they've developed, and, and they're going to give some practical examples of what we can do uh, in, in terms of understanding uh, literature from different ways, uh, from different angles, different perspectives. Um, if you have any focus questions about the, the software technology, about the presentation, please put them in a chat. If you have any more wider kind of concerns about what we're discussing about uh, the implications for traditional literary studies, uh, maybe something that is part of, of a discussion of the of the, the status, the authority of the humanities. Um, please keep that uh, to one side and we'll come back to that towards the end uh, of the session. OK, so I'm just going to say something about where I come from, and I hope that you are able to see uh, my screen now. Uh, the dreaded share your screen button is on. Um, I, at the moment, am working on an AHSC funded project. It's called Novel Perceptions. Um, it's looking at the ways in which 
people have specific attitudes to literature, towards contemporary fiction, um, we are asking them to rate uh, a corpus of 400 contemporary novels. We ask them to uh, rate the literary uh, kind of style, the, the literary quality of novels, but also how they enjoy those novels. And this research has come about from earlier research that was done by Karina van Dalen Oscom, um, which was called The Riddle of Literary Quality. And uh, she's going to talk a bit more about that. But what we're really interested in is to understand a certain mismatch that is taking place when people read books, when they interpret characters, they interpret the status of authors. Um, why do people buy certain books? Uh, how do they make decisions? These are some of the things that we want to find out. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second, about what methodologies we use. And uh, we have been working on that project for about um, uh, a year, um, and, and we're slowly moving towards the analysis of a corpus of 400 contemporary novels, comparing that with a survey. And I'll say a bit more about that. But this has come about uh, also via a research that we did uh, with the BBC, BBC Arts. There was a project called The Novels That Shaped Our World. I'm sure many of you know it. Um, it was kind of challenging the canon. And there was an alternative canon of 100 novels uh, divided up into a number of categories. Uh, and Karina and, and myself and my, my team were invited to work with the BBC to understand how the public was responding uh, to, to those uh, 100 novels. And we published a number of uh, uh, stories with the BBC and we kind of were kind of testing out what we were doing. We were kind of looking at people's subjective responses to the novels. How, how did they rate them? And how did people in Scotland rate things differently from people in London or Wales or Exeter? Um, and, and comparing that with a computational analysis of the style of those 100 novels. Um, we've done various engagement events and uh, our research is also part of a, a 10 week long podcast series turn up for the book. So this is what was happening from 2019, 2020, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we were kind of, yeah, kind of testing out the possibilities of, of these new technologies. We have now returned to novel perceptions. We also call it the Big Book Review. It's the, the Big Book Review is the survey that we've launched. Um, and as you can see, what we're doing is, is in a way complex. It's also, we think, quite new. We've got a traditional English literature approach to understand uh, this, this corpus that we're kind of investigating. We're, uh, we've launched a psychological survey um, to understand how people respond to those novels in terms of literary quality and really enjoyment, right? Why uh, is there a difference between <laughs> uh, the rating of cultural value and, and maybe what people really enjoy, so reading as, as comfort, reading as a safe space? What are the factors uh, that, that people kind of think about when they think about those types of questions? And then um, Karina and Imad and, and a number of other people are, are looking at the computational analysis of um, uh, the corpus. So for the BBC, it was 100. For Novel Perceptions, it's 400. And just to kind of, yeah, to clarify what we're doing, on the one hand, you've got the subjective perception of a large group of people, right? We, we, we've got about 25,000 ratings of 400 novels in terms of literary quality. And then what Emat and Karina are kind of doing is to sift through those 400 novels and, and kind of suss out, kind of understand the signature, the style of the novel. And you can then pit those two against one another. So I'm, I'm maybe oversimplifying things. Karina will uh, correct me uh, at some point, I think. Uh, but this is kind of what we're doing. And uh, it's been really quite interesting. Uh, of course, we're looking at um, uh, document length, for instance. So um, how does the size, the scope of a particular novel add to the presumption that this is to do with quality? OK, so um, that's one thing we're doing. We're also looking at the average uh, sentence length. Um, there's a clear trend there. We can clearly see um, that um, the longer the sentence uh, people associated with a 
a more difficult style. And we can also see that uh, books written before the 20th century, written in longhand, they often are much longer in terms of um, their style. So um, that's something we, we want to think about as well. Um, we're looking at distinctive words, et cetera, et cetera. And we are doing some case studies. So we have been pitting, um, for instance, Poor Cow uh, uh, by Nell Dunn against uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's Remains of the Day, which is a Booker Prize winning novel, uh, also by a, a kind of a Nobel Prize winning writer. And we're looking at how people uh, are kind of assessing that. So as you can see on the right hand side here, this is the kind of the literary assessment. Ishiguro is doing pretty good, right? He's doing very good. And uh, Disgrace, written by uh, Kudzea, another Booker Prize winner, um, he won the Booker Prize twice. Again, really high score in terms of literary quality. When you look at Paul Cow, which in my assessment is a really good uh, novel, it's, it's really good. It kind of imitates all sorts of dialects. Um, it's done loads of research into how to represent working class women in South London. We can see, though, that this doesn't pay off. Um, the representation of um, dialect, uh, that's a problem. People are kind of, um, in a way, are being put off by it. They, they don't think it's literary when you use a South London or Cockney accent, for instance. Um, I'm running out of time, but these are some of the things that we have been Thinking about a bit later on, I will introduce you to the software Voyant, where we have uh, found some quite interesting things. So one of the things that Karina and I were doing is to look at the way in which um, words associated with emotions, with strong emotions, um, how they were dispersed across the novels. Uh, of a specific category. In, in this case, it was the a class and society. A category of the BBC project we were working on. And it struck us that very often when you look at the trends, it is women who are more explicit in, in naming emotions, in naming love uh, and, and various other forms, grief as well. And uh, many male writers, they were very sparse when it came to using, identifying, engaging with emotions. So there was a clear discrepancy. Um, of course, this is only one, one category uh, that we were thinking about. Um, it is shows a trend, right? It doesn't say something conclusive. And I think one of the, the things we want to get across today is that computational literary studies doesn't offer this kind of great final solution or a, a complete new way of looking at it um, at, at literature. But what's important is that it, it kind of suggests where we may want to do more detailed research and combining it with different fields. Um, there's much more that I want to talk to you about. Uh, I'll, I'll do that maybe a bit later, but uh, we need to now move on to Karina, who's going to talk to you about her use of Antconc. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Bas, for your introduction. And uh, there are so many things to talk about uh, when we're talking about computational literary studies. I don't know where to start. So I've set very clear limits for my own talk. Um, I'll share my screen for a super, super short introduction to computational literary studies with an example of my own research. So let me find the correct <laughs> button. Um, so, a very short introduction. Um, some examples of, of questions that I've asked myself in a previous work I've done. And some of the other speakers today will, will go into these topics in more detail, I would expect. So, who was the author of a text? If we don't know for sure who wrote a certain text, Computational literary studies has developed several methods to find out who is the most probable author of a text. Um, together with my colleague Joris von Zundert, I looked at a medieval uh, Arthurian romance, for instance, to find out where the second author took over from the first author. And that led to a new way of viewing uh, collaborative authorship. I also looked at medieval scribes, how much freedom they allowed themselves when copying a text. Um, 
and how authors collaborating influenced the writing style of the things they wrote together. Um, and so all these uh, topics are related to authorship. Um, but of course, we also want to go beyond authorship. Uh, one of my favorite uh, linguistic features uh, are proper names in literary texts. And I've also looked into uh, the, the function of proper names in literary novels and the frequency, what is normal in uh, a normal novel. And for instance, found out that in children's books, there are more proper names instead of pronouns the explicit use of proper names is mentioned and that's measurable we can see that when we start measure start to measure that linguistic features in those texts um, so it opens our eyes to new possibilities to to distinctions that we would not be able to see just reading the text from close by the project i've been working on for the past 10 years is what Bas already mentioned the riddle of literary quality in which we uh, analyzed whether there is a concrete linguistic difference between novels that readers perceive as being highly literary compared to those books that they do not consider to have high literary quality. And I want to give an example of one of the topics I addressed uh, in that research, and namely the question if translations show different patterns in word usage than originals. And I'll go into the translation uh, part a little bit later on, because I will consider this from the Dutch perspective, where translations play a very important role in the literary field. But first, uh, the measurements I've been doing uh, mostly deal with words, words, and more words. So my data are the words in the novels. Um, it's for, for many people new to the discipline, it's, it's uh, quite surprising to have a look at the list of most frequent words in a text. And I'll give you an example in a second. So we're looking at the most frequent words. Uh, most of these words are function words and not content words. So they are articles, pronouns, uh, prepositions, and hardly any nouns or main verbs. Although there are a lot of personal names in the list, as you will see. And um, analyzing the bags of words of all these novels is a very easy way to analyze large corpora of texts. And if you are um, uh, new to this area, it, one, of the, one of my favorite tools to advise is Antconk, uh, developed by Lawrence Anthony uh, for his uh, university in uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it's a concordancing tool. It's freely downloadable from the internet with a lot of information. I've uh, put a screenshot of the uh, start page, the home page of Antconk uh, on my slide. And uh, some of the things you can do using that tool, when you have, of course, some digital files you'd like to analyze, you can make a frequency list, you can make concordances, so you can see the words you are searching in context with a link to the full text. Uh, you can look for collocations, so the frequencies of words used in proximity to the word you're searching, and you can contrast texts or corpora, searching for the keyness uh, uh, values of words. So words used uh, higher than could be predicted uh, than uh, in, in one text or corpus compared to another. And I'll show you how that's done in a minute. Um, let me go to Antkonk uh, to show you an example. So I'll switch my screens, going to this example. I hope you'll see my um, Antkonk version with uh, Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, on screen, I've uploaded a digital file of this novel, and I've selected the option word list. And you see that the most frequent word in this text is the article V. Uh, here is the frequency. And you can scroll down and explore the whole list. And it's clear that these are a lot of function words uh, where you can do something with statistics. There's so many of these 
you can make uh, firm observations looking at, at these function words. On the contrary, when you go down, usually almost half of all the words in a text occur only once. And you'll have a look here at a couple of them, starting with a P and well, there are a lot of words only occurring once. And you can, for instance, click on a word and look at the concordance plot. You can see which words are in front of it and after it. You can do all kinds of analysis. So it's, it's a great tool to, to get an idea of the data you're dealing with. And you can upload as many uh, files as you want. Um, I'll stop sharing this screen again and go back to my uh, slideshow again. And go to my next slide to give you one example of the research I've done. So in the Netherlands, uh, about 65% of all fiction and poetry in 2009 was translated. So only 35% was originally Dutch. Um, in the meantime, by the way, the number of translations is, de is decreasing because the younger Dutch generations read uh, a lot more English originals. And that has an influence on how many money, how much money uh, publishers spend on um, uh, translations. Um, but in 2013, when we did our large survey in the Netherlands, uh, Dutch readers were very critical about translation quality. And most of the translations are from English. And one of the questions I had that I wanted to try to answer was, can we measure translation quality? Well, translation quality is a very iffy topic. It's almost as difficult as uh, literary quality. It's difficult to pose that question. So I rephrased it to uh, look at it as follows. Translators in the, in the Netherlands try to create an English original in Dutch as if it was written in Dutch. That is kind of the translation ideal at the moment. The translation should be fluent in Dutch. And so my idea was, what if I contrast Dutch original novels with translations into Dutch from English? and see if there are any differences in the vocabulary. Uh, are there any words that stand out in the translations compared to the originals? Because these, these words may hint at where the translations are perhaps not that fluent as uh, readers or translators themselves would think. So I used the uh, keyness function in Antkong to find out whether this could help. And I'll show you the example again. I kind of pre-baked this option as well in another Antkong uh, version. So I've uploaded a whole list of English uh, translations from English. And in the tool preferences, I've added as a contrast corpus the Dutch originals. So I apply that. First, I make a word list. And it takes a couple of seconds before these files are processed. But when they are, I can change to the keyword list. And that will present the words that occur uh, unexpectedly more often in the English uh, uh, translations. So the translations from English into Dutch then could be expected based on the Dutch corpus it is being compared with. And well, a lot of personal names you can see, Arla, Corina, John de Lark, Kirsten, um, but also some uh, pronouns, uh, ze, uh, her, some uh, verbs, uh, said, was, and well, this is a good way to just scroll down and have a look at what's in this list. And I'll go back to the results again in my slides, because what 
I saw then is that there were a couple of conjunctions that occurred significantly more often in uh, the translations from English compared to Dutch. And uh, I've listed them here. The most significant was the Dutch well, uh, roughly a translation of although, and that was really a very, um, uh, very much more prominent in translations from English. And well, this leads us to thinking about differences between the two languages and uh, the English gerund, of course, has uh, is, is not well is not in Dutch in the same time. So translators have to find a way how to translate that in a good way. And so this may be one of the words where translators from English into Dutch will have to look at before they hand in their final translation to make sure that they do not use it more often than uh, would be normal. And it's well possible that readers kind of pick up on these high frequency words when they occur more and that unconsciously they know, they feel that something's not quite as it should be uh, in originally Dutch novels. So my final slide, um, why is this useful? Well, it's uh, if you use this kind of data and tools and you share the data and you use tools that others have also access to, others can replicate your measurements. And that should be uh, uh, confirming uh, your results and that is more convincing to others, and it's a good basis to do further research on. Another uh, option is that you use a different measurement to verify the result of one calculation, one measurement. Uh, for instance, in this case, I've also applied a principal component analysis uh, to see if indeed, if I look at those six conjunctions that I mentioned, and I look at the two uh, corpora, can we see a difference? And indeed we can. This was done by the Stylo package for R, and uh, some of the next speakers will go into this, but this is just a teaser for you to uh, see how we can um, uh, use different tools. For all of these tools, you, you need some training, but you can do this without learning to, to uh, be a programmer yourself. And uh, it really helps us thinking about new possibilities. So where to go next from here, looking at the outliers, and uh, it leads to all kinds of new questions. And in the meantime, translators in the Netherlands uh, are very interested in what I've just told you and have asked me to talk about this at their next conference in the summer. So you can see how things can change some topics. Uh, and it's really very interesting. So that's what I want to leave you with for today. Uh, just. Uh, mentioning that uh, this will be discussed as well in an English version of my Dutch book that was published last year. And hopefully the English version will be available by the end of this year. So thank you for now. Great, thank you, Karina. That's really fascinating. Um, I think we should move swiftly on to Machi Ada, please. And you kind of introduced him already, Machi. Um, I believe you're gonna talk a bit about Stylo, is that right? Yes, it is. Uh, I, I was hoping to be visible through the second camera, but somehow it does mm. not work properly. Yeah. If this is not working, I will switch back to that other one. And it's also not a big deal, I guess. So let's do that. Okay, so uh, okay. thank you. Yeah, I will start sharing my screen if possible. I hope you can see the slides. Uh, so, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Maciej Eder. I'm from the, the Polish Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Polish Language. I'm using right now the slides for the CLS Infra project, which is somehow connected to, to what we are uh, 
uh, to what we are doing here uh, this afternoon. A CLS Infra, which is Computational uh, Literary Studies Infrastructure project, Projects, a project to provide um, networks, tools, uh, some standards, uh, resources, meaning corpora, and other means to, uh, to conduct the research in the field of uh, CLS, Computational Literary Studies. And today I'm going to provide a very, very brief introduction to stylometry into the package stylo. Um, and you know the obvious disclaimer here being that in 15 minutes time, you can just you know, scratch the, the surface and that's what I'm going to do uh, in the um, upcoming couple of, couple of minutes. Uh, so to start with, uh, stylometry is about comparing. We should be aware about that, that stylometry is about relating one text against other texts or one against um, a second one or a text against a corpus of different uh, collection of texts or some sub collections, for example, bad literature uh, against good literature and so on and so on and so on. So the uh, basic idea behind that is that this is always a relative. This is always about uh, comparing. This is always reason to, um, to another bunch of texts. Texts or text samples if we decide to slice a given text into sub samples. And uh, stylometry can uh, culminate, uh, can result in many different ways of showing the final results. But um, what people find usually find very attractive is the uh, unsupervised um, final plots, such as that one. This is a multidimensional scaling um, the final plot. You've all, already seen uh, some of those in Karina's um, the presentation a couple of minutes ago. And it basically shows you the, um, the relative um, uh, similarities between texts and dissimilarities between texts or groups of texts. In here, we've seen like 20 texts by three different authors, and they are, uh, they are, it's quite evident here, they are grouping, they are, they are, they tend to group, they tend to cluster into three distinct group uh, groups or distinct clusters. Uh, and it, um, it apparently means that um, different authors, meaning uh, Joseph Conrad, um, Charles Dickens, and Jane Austen, of course, they are very different, and we know that. But we've got a clear proof, a clear computational proof uh, in here that these are really different because they form three different distinct, uh, distinct groups that don't overlap, right? And this is, this is one of the ideas that stylometry is, um, is dealing with. So seeking for groups of similar texts, that's, that's the basic aim of, of stylometric investigations. It can be um, represented um, using a dendrogram, which is a tree-like structure like that one, showing um, branches, and the leaves, the leaves being particular texts or text uh, samples. And uh, the goal is to observe who is connected to whom or what is connected to what, or which um, the genre is uh, connected to which one, or uh, do the texts tend to cluster chronologically, or is there any uh, translatorial signal, meaning that you know, different texts translated by the same, by the same person uh, are more likely to group together. This kind of uh, observations are to be made using this kind of, of um, the final results. Or there is yet another one, which is referred to as a bootstrap consensus tree. But as you can see, this is always about comparing. So we take different texts and we find the ways of showing um, using different means, but showing the relations between texts. This is the New Testament, the uh, Greek, Greek New Testament, with some of the books clustering together or occupying the same branches, some other texts uh, being detached. And uh, if you've got the supporting hypothesis, then, um, then, um, then this kind of final results can, um, can corroborate or, or, or falsify your, your working hypothesis. So stylometry is, um, is about comparing. And now the big question is, why should we do this kind of comparison? And Karina has already answered that question. She has already addressed it in, in one of her slides. 
um, because there is many different applications for stylometric, um, stylometric tests or measurements, one of them being authorship attribution. So finding out who is the author of an anonymous text um, in question. Um, just to provide a very simple example, this is a question of who wrote or was Aeschylus, the ancient Greek writer, actually the author of the Prometheus Band um, tragedy? And uh, what we could do and what we usually do, we compare different texts by similar, by not really similar, but the author, authors that could have written the text in question. So we compile, uh, we collect a corpus, a, com a comparison corpus, and then we observe how those texts relate one to another. In this very picture, we see basically four different branches, four different authors that are marked in different colors. Euripides, Aeschylus, uh, Sophocles and uh, Aristophanes, the author of the comedies. And here is the text in question, which as you can see, is not falling into the cluster of Aeschylus. And this is a, not a very strong, but still an evidence that this Prometheus band uh, strategy is, is different, stylistically different from other works by Aeschylus, so probably not written by Aeschylus. There are some other ways um, of, or some other um, pieces of evidence that should be taken into account, but stylometrically speaking, this uh, very book is not written by Aeschylus. So authorship attribution is one of the applications of stylometry, but it can go all the way to um, the so-called distant reading paradigm. Distant reading, which tries to assess a general question um, kind of was also covering some of those general questions of how big groups, large groups of texts uh, behave when put into one comparison corpus. So, uh, for example, this is the corpus of uh, Stanisław Lem, a Polish uh, sci-fi writer. Of course, we know that he was the author of all the books um, that are claimed to be uh, him, right? So not the question of authorship is, is concerned here, but the questions about the question, uh, how are their books, uh, how the books written by him uh, relate one to another? And we can see here this kind of a, a whale or a fish like structure. This is a network. And this part uh, over here, this is the, um, the uh, novels and that one this is the um, non-fiction so his his essays basically and there are some uh, two um, two um, novels in between which are well quite 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 interesting ones this is uh, his master's voice and golem the 14 which are halfway into the uh, essayistic style. And uh, here I marked in, in, in different colors, the development, the chronological development of style over time. And interestingly, um, it is not the, um, the topic. So not the, the sci-fi versus the, the realistic novels that he also authored uh, being the factor here, but chronology that drives this, uh, this picture, right? So this distant reading paradigm makes it possible to show, uh, to see, uh, to see uh, literature from a distance, from a bird's eye view. And now stylometry is, um, is a nice um, approach, is a nice uh, bunch of methods to approach this kind of questions, but we have to realize one very important thing um, before we go any further. And this is uh, that you can compare anything you want basically, right? You can compare the usage of metaphors in your corpus. You can uh, they compare topics, different topics um, that are used by different authors, but stylometry is not doing this. Stylometry instead is uh, focusing on style, but style, very specific part of style, which is the frequencies of some of the words of say 100 most frequent words, for example. So this is a very, very important disclaimer to say that stylometry is not um, a means to save the world. This is not the method to um, address each and every uh, research question, right? What, whenever, the style is concerned, stylometry is a, is a, is a good um, idea to, to, to apply, but apart from that, you should be aware that, uh, that stylometry is not necessarily the only method out there. So in most of the um, text mining approaches, we usually get rid of the so-called stop words. So the words that, you know, who cares about the words such as for, in, of, upon, and so on. 
Uh, however, in stylometry, we are very, very much interested in keeping them uh, because the idea of the stylistic fingerprint, so the uh, features, the linguistic features that make us unique is very much based on the frequencies, on the distribution of those frequent words or function words. Function words, so this uh, linguistic glue, this um, these words that bear very, very little meaning themselves, but they are, um, they, are, um, they, they are putting the meaning words together. So these are the words responsible for this, for this um, scaffolding or you know, keeping, keeping the language together. And these are mostly approached by just taking the most frequent words into the, into the equation. So what we do in stylometry, those pictures that you've seen already are based on the frequencies of the most frequent words, uh, full stop, right? So this is, this is how um, the differentiation between different uh, texts looks like when most frequent words are concerned. The words such as the, in, of, for, that, on, et, and so on. And now I'm going to say a few words about the package stylo, which is a piece of software, not a very, very um, a big one, it's, it's a tiny library written in the R programming language. So it needs also the R programming shell to be installed in the computer. And it is one of the very few uh, programs that is tailored uh, to do just stylometry. So it, it, it uh, responds to the newest stylometric method, methods that are, that are around. And unlike uh, the general statistical software, it's, it's specifically designed to do this kind of stylometric measurements. And um, I'm one, one of the authors of this uh, package stylo. And on behalf of the authors, I can say that um, you know, being simple uh, and user friendly was one of the factors very important from the very beginning, yet still R at cell is not a simple tool. So there is some common line well, not really coding, but some typing um, required when you want to use R, R and, and the package style with R. Uh, however, there is a quite a bunch of documentation on different levels for, for newcomers, from uh, more advanced uh, study in these students, and for really uh, geeks also available on our website. And uh, before I go to the documentation, uh, to the uh, demo, Part, I will be very happy to point you to our website. Uh, the address is very, very difficult to just type it right now. I can do it over here in, where is this Zoom thing in the chat. Uh, however, you just type, uh, com or you just Google for computational stylistics group, and then uh, you will see the resources and the blog posts and the documentation for the package stylo and the blog posts on some non-obvious um, non and advanced functions that you might want to use. Now, with all that being said, I will be uh, very happy to uh, show some demonstration how this uh, um, stylo package works. So to start with, here is here is my corpus. So I've got the corpus of like 20, maybe a little bit more English uh, poems. That's um, Browning, uh, Bishop by Browning. So it's just text, right? Just text files. Christmas Eve by, by Browning and so on and so on. That's all I need. I need some texts uh, grouped into the uh, subdirectory corpus. And I, Mm, just launch R, I will make it bigger for everyone to see. So I have launched R. Now I launch the library style, so the package style. Now I say where my corpus is. And now I start the package style. So basically three, uh, three fun functions, three commands are needed here to run the package style. And now there's plenty of different options that you might want to fiddle uh, around with, but I, I will just click okay for the first time to see what's, what is going to uh, happen. And here it is, that's the final result of the 
cluster analysis for this uh, collection of 20 plus um, English um, epic poetry um, texts, uh, mostly from the 19th century with some texts from the late 17th century, such as uh, Milton, the Paradise Lost, the, Par the, the Paradise Lost, the Paradise uh, Regain and Samson, right? And some Tennyson, Wordsworth, and so on and so on. And as you can see, or to start with what you could not see, is that the computer had no idea what or who wrote what and who was the author of which of the texts. Because the labels, the labels are were not known to the computer. The labels um, they come from the file names and the computer had no idea who wrote what and what was similar to what, right? The labels were attached afterwards here. So this is quite important because all the uh, results are based on just the frequencies of the most frequent words. And now we can see that the computer um, distinguished Browning as a, as a distinct cluster here, right? Same goes for Patmore, uh, for Keats, for, uh, for, for Wordsworth, and other, for Milton, of course. And um, by doing so, you can um, distinguish some groups of texts that belong either to uh, particular authors or to particular uh, genres or to, to, to one of two uh, genders. Uh, that depends on your research question, and that depends on uh, the texts you're, you have collected. As you could see in one of Karina's um, slides, there, were, there was a distinction into two uh, groups, right? You can do it uh, also using the package stylo, plus it was actually done by the package stylo. So it vastly, um, vastly uh, depends on the research question you might want to ask. Um, in order to, 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 to tweak the final parameters. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the final parameters right now or the input parameters for the procedure because I don't want to make this procedure too much complex. But just uh, as a final note, if you can um, have a look once more into the, um, into the, um, the panel, um, this, with the settings for the package style, there is quite a bunch of those settings. Each of those can be tweaked if each of those can be uh, tailored to your needs, which is not to say that you should find the ones you liked best, but other you should link it to some theoretical assumptions of your research question. But this is by far um, not for tonight. This is, this is something that, that we should discuss. Um, the other day. So thank you very much for, for being with me for this 15 minutes and I am passing over to, to Sebastian. Yeah, that, that was really amazing, Machi. Uh, there's so much going on and uh, we've got some questions in the chat for both you and Karina. And I, I just want to, these are quite focused questions. So I'd like to briefly uh, get these answered before we move on. Um, so I think I want to start with Karina. Uh, would you mind answering the question that we have from Maizaki? I just put my answer. Oh, you put it in the, the chat. The, okay, the thank chat. you. It's, it's easiest to have a look at the abstract of the paper. Fine. Excellent. Um, do, so that's solved. Uh, and there was a question for you also, Machi, but it's kind of technical. So again, maybe you can put that in the, in the chat if that's okay. Um, yeah, I struggle to see which question is. Uh, it's it was uh, the exact algorithm for consensus trees. Ah, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just a reference. So you can resolve that in the chat, I would think. Uh, there is though a question from my colleague uh, Anastasia. Um, and this is about um, expanding on the use of stylistic devices such as metaphors and metonymies uh, and how they can be compared in texts. Um, it is quite difficult to identify metaphors and corpora. What methods do you use? Is it either one of you who wants to take that one? I can start and Marci can follow up perhaps because uh, this is one of the most difficult things you, you can uh, want to analyze and that's why I don't do it yet because you would need so many steps in between uh, for instance tagging uh, what you consider to be a metaphor 
uh, and someone else would perhaps give a different tag to the same metaphor. So there, there are many steps in between that would make the results either more confusing than convincing. So I stick with the low level features and measure them and try to do as much as possible with them mm -hmm. and uh, uh, well keep my distance from the really difficult <coughs> stuff for now. But perhaps Machi has a nice solution. Yes, I won't add much more to that, I'm afraid, uh, because you know the figurative language and the metaphors are meant to be, um, well, complex and difficult even for a, for a, for you know for even advanced reader uh, readers uh, let alone the computers so this kind of language is meant to be um, routinely non-obvious right if we go to some uh, historical stuff from the 17th century from the 15th century it's not very simple to uncover some of the metaphors right without the footnotes and that's that's I I would say it's done on purpose. So this is this is as Karina said. This is not the 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 direction I would be very happy to 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 go right now because that's not something for the computers. From what I know, maybe of course there are some ideas of um, getting the metaphors using neural networks. Well, I don't know. Okay, it's it's interesting. So this session is. If I may, if I may, yeah, one, yeah, sure, one, on, one, one more uh, yeah. word. Um, the, when we restrict ourselves to style uh, style itself, there's like only a few percent of it that we can measure, right? So uh, this reductionist is is the only way to go if we want to stick to this uh, low um, low features, which are very simple to extract, but also uh, very difficult to falsify, right? Because they, these are there in the text and uh, whether you use a machine or not, if you didn't use a machine and you did it, did it manu manually, it would take ages, but you know, the results would be very much the same. Whereas for this high level features, such metaphorical, such as metaphorical, you know, language, uh, it will differ from one reader to another. And this is something that, you know, computational methods are not very good at. Mm -hmm. These are good at very, very simple, simple features that you can measure, right? And, and uh, can you measure, measure irony? Are you, are, you, are you able to do that a bit more? Because that's also quite tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is tricky. Plus, you know, for some people, it is tricky to <laughs> <laughs> discover irony. <laughs> Great. I mean, the session is about sort of exploring possibilities, but also finding out where are the limits. So maybe we've just discovered or agreed on, on certain limits. Um, right, we're running a bit behind schedule. So I want to move on to Martin, who has also just put uh, a comment in uh, the chat box. Um, do, 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 uh, Martin, do you want to, shall we resolve this right now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Somebody, somebody asked a question about the algorithm that was used, and mm. uh, Matthew can correct me if wrong, but I think it's borrows his delta run on uh, sequential most number of words and just takes the consensus of multiple runs. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. But when it comes to a, a very consensus approach, then there is this. Um, I will, I will send a a, a link to the to mm -hmm. that. But yeah, that that's right. That the that the core of the method is the delta, and yeah. So thank you for clarifying. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Right, we're going to move on to um, uh, Martin. Uh, and just to say that Martin has just published his new book, uh, The Digital Humanities and Literary Studies. Um, so prolific and an incredible brain that we have at, at work here. So thank you very much for, for being here with us today, uh, Martin. Take it away. Thank you, Baz, and, and thanks so much to Karina and Machi for uh, your great talks. Um, also, thanks to Machi for Stylo, which I've, I've actually used myself in the past. So um, it's it's a real honor to be able to speak alongside um, people who are, are making such a change in the world. Um, I guess I want to just briefly frame this by thinking about the fact that we're separated today by distance, but brought together by technology. Um, this is great during an ongoing pandemic, um, but it's almost the inverse of how Wordsworth described his residency in London, where he, he talked about how we live 
even next door neighbors, as we say, yet still strangers and knowing not each other's names. Um, we're very much apart, but we have our Zoom names attached in our contemporary world. Um, and there's a certain poignancy to running uh, a computational literary studies seminar at distance like this, because while the best known phrase for computational literary methodologies is distant reading, I want to talk a little bit today about the ways in which computational and digitally mediated reading practices can actually bring us closer to texts, to show how these approaches need not be about broad scale literary history, about an alienation from interpretive paradigms, but instead can furnish us with fresh evidence to think about interpretations. And so I'm also going to talk to you today about one aspect of my simple computational methodological interventions, um, which I usually bill under the kind of broad heading of registers of knowledge, a phrase that tries to speak to how literary reading techniques can be used to provide us with access to a set of differing epistemologies that all take inscriptive forms, so historical, scientific, digital, factual, and literary. But what I wanted to point out was that there's there are many people doing extremely clever, um, extremely difficult things with machine learning techniques at the moment. Um, Ted Underwood's work springs to mind. Um, Andrew Piper's work. Richard Jean So has been doing some really interesting stuff on race and the history of um, publishing and digital methods for studying that. Um, I want to back up and say actually there are some very simple things that we can do. Uh, that can help us to, to read and understand literary works and to give us data that we wouldn't otherwise have for our interpretations. I'm going to talk to you today about my work on David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas in that respect. Um, I also wanted to point out that we've, we've talked about this as a kind of brave new humanities and there's this um, constant discourse of novelty going around. But although we like to think of this as a contemporary debate, it also has a long pedigree or lineage. Vernon Lee proposed a statistical experiment on literature, a quantitative analysis, in her 1923 The Handling of Words, in which she said that such, quote, statistical labours had brought to light remarkable and suggestive differences in the use to which these words were put, end quote, in Henry James and Hardy. So even when the statistical labours themselves were potentially fruitless, Lee tells us that the count may not be important, but the act of counting may be. So there was this focus even in the 1920s on how quantitative methods might help us understand texts. William Empson also wrote in Seven Types of Ambiguity of how, despite the serious challenges of a more scientific approach to art, he sat on the side of empiricism and reason in literary criticism and using data from the text in various ways to ensure that those inform the way that we think about literary works. So not computational approaches, but quantitative analysis of literature that underpins our computational methods goes back a very long way indeed and has a much longer history than I think we often acknowledge in the discipline. But let's think about a text. So David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, for those who don't know, is a spectacularly good novel for digital literary studies um, for one particular reason. So it's a work that moves through six different time periods from 1850 through to a far flung future dystopian science fictional world. And each section of the novel is written in a kind of generic pastiche. So um, the first chapter, The Pacific Diary of Adam Ewing, for instance, pays homage to Herman Melville's seafaring narratives and is supposedly written in the language of its time. So it's supposed to look like it was written in 1850. Um, by contrast, the chapter entitled Half Lives is written as a kind of pacey airport thriller. It's the only section of the novel written in the present tense voicing. You get these kind of uh, Bill Smoke lurks, Louisa Ray creeps, and all this repetition of full names of characters as the start of sentences to give this kind of pace, repetition, and situationness to it. Um, Slusha's Crossing, the final chapter, is a supposedly regressed future language, um, actually based on Russell Hoban's 1980 novel Ridley Walker. But what's interesting is this stylistic variety in a single novel gives us a rich playground for digital aesthetic critique and literary linguistic profiling. So rather than thinking about authorship attribution from stylistics, which, which both of my previous speakers uh, have touched upon, this gives us, a, us an opportunity to examine a text where we know it's written by a single author, but there are specific generic mutations and attempts to pastiche other styles. So 
if authorship profiling tools look at this text and think that Ewing is written by someone different to um, the Cavendish section, for instance, we know that something strange is happening under the hood with respect to the language in this novel, and that's why it's, it's useful. Also worth saying, um, this novel jumps about in quite a strange way. So halfway through each of the chapters, the text splits into the next chapter. So um, we go forward a kind of one half chapter at a time in, in the novel's chronology through to this future world of Sleecher's Crossing before we get the second half of each chapter in a kind of reverse pyramid structure. And you can, you can see that in my, my slide here. So I also want to point out this is a novel that um, issues ideas of Whig history or the idea that progress is just a linear move through history. And this is really important because I'm going to show you how my digital approaches actually give us a new reading of how we understand this. But most people who look at Cloud Atlas take the fact that actually the future science fictional world is dystopian, the future um, world of Seleucia's Crossing is more like the Iron Age, and it seems to us to say, actually, you know what, people don't just get better over history. Um, they actually regress ethically as well as technologically, and time has a much more cyclical kind of historical pattern than we might think. And that's, that's what Cloud Atlas seems to say, and in most interpretations, people conclude. Um, or so I thought, except it turns out that this novel is betrayed in its ambition by its own language if we pay close attention and if we use some computational methods to pull it out. So having seen Mitchell's performance of the language of 1850, I was curious to know how much does he get wrong? So I set out, therefore, to write a computer program to detect terminology that should, in theory, have been inaccessible uh, to Mitchell's narrator. Now, I should add there's a complexity to this because in the story, apparently the diary object from 1850 has been edited by a future character probably before 1920 or so. So there's a, a gap in the historical period, but I'm just going to gloss over that a little bit for concision today. But to cut a long story short, so I wrote a dictionary scraper that essentially got all the words from this chapter of Cloud Atlas, went to um, various dictionary sites like the OED API and um, dictionary.com and pulled out the etymologies of these terms, trying to find their first usage dates. And it turns out, I think, that there are just three terms that Mitchell's historic author or editor uh, could not really have used. So spillage, which comes from 1934, so you couldn't have that in 1850, uh, Latino from 1946, and Lazy Eye from 1960. So focusing on just those two latter terms, the word Latino didn't actually come to prominence until after the Second World War. Um, but the use here of a racial epithet has an important different effect for the construction of a stylistic imaginary of the 19th century, to which I'll turn shortly. Um, secondly, Mitchell gives us a parlour inhabited by a monstrous hogshead afflicted with drop, droop jaw and lazy eye killed by the twins on their 16th birthday. Um, so the sources that I consulted show that this, this slang term for amblyopia, lazy eye, I actually have a lazy eye, so it's kind of interesting, um, first appears in the middle of the 20th century. So again, not accessible to a writer from 1850. So, so far, that's also formalistically interesting. Mitchell's done a pretty good job at linguistic mimesis within a work of purported historical fiction. Um, but it's also clear that readers are very poor as identifying terms that are anachronistic. I had no idea that spillage came from the 1930s. Um, in fact, I'm unsure that if you ask them, readers would be able to point to these particular words as markers of the language seeming not to ring true. So how then do you create a linguistic styling that looks like it's mimetic of 1850 when you're working under the assumption that readers won't know when words were coined? Um, is it about more than just using the right words from, from the period? It seems, seems that is the case. Um, and I began to question instead whether Mitchell might simply be using uncommon language to create the perception of a stylistic affinity with Victorian era prose uh, for the 20th century reader, 21st century reader. And this formalistic question pushed me back to the text and specifically to examine more closely the archaic overloading of Mitchell's novel. 
So I asked a second formalistic question that I addressed with computational methods. Which words does David Mitchell use in this 1850 section that are not present in a magazine corpus from the year of the novel's actual publication, 2004? So a magazine from 2004, we get a, lo we get a, a large number of these from a cor corpus called COCA, which is the Corpus of Contemporary American Writing. And I thought, OK, let's see which words occur in this chapter that's supposedly written 1850 that aren't in this contemporary magazine. So which vocabularies then build our historical imaginary of 19th century style? And some of the answers are quite gimmicky. So as with Pynchon's Mason and Dixon, if people know that novel, um, David Mitchell replaces all uses of and with an ampersand in this section to give a kind of imagined typographical synthesis with the historical period. Um, this isn't strictly accurate, by the way. If you look at the first pas passage of Moby Dick, a text used in 18, written in 1850, um, you can see that ampersands do not appear instead of and. And several passages of that novel would be totally acceptable in contemporary spoken English if they weren't already so, so well known. I mean, call me Ishmael. There is nothing surprising in this. These sound like sentences that could come from a novel of any time. They're not very historically rooted. Perhaps the more disturbing and political linguistic conclusion at which I arrived is simply that Mitchell's language of 1850 is rife with terms of racial abuse and insensitivity to disability. So while the text redacts the word damn for apparent fear of, of offence, it prints outright the N word and uses the terms blackamoor and Latino. So that latter word that, that I pointed to earlier, yes, it's not actually a word that you could have in 1850, but it looks like to us it fits a 19th century context because it sounds like a dated term of racial categorization from the era of empire. The same goes for lazy eye, which sounds like a pejorative term for a disability. It sounds like you're insulting someone who has a medical condition wrong with them. And again, um, this gives us this impression that, ah, it's the bad old days when um, people with disabilities were, were referred to with pejorative languages. And there are two kind of points really that arise from this close attention to language, which I identified through the use of computational methods. Um, and they're kind of questions that, that I haven't fully resolved, but that we could think about. So first, is it ethical for Mitchell or a contemporary writer to use such techniques? which rely on specific linguistic appropriations in order to create an aesthetic outcome of historical effect. And second, and perhaps more importantly, doesn't this contradict that more common reading of an anti-Whig historiography in the novel that I gestured towards earlier? The reason that readers might think the Ewing diary sounds like it came from 1850 is because of a belief that these terms are now outmoded and are not used. A belief fundamentally that for us, things are better now than they were at that time and that we make progress away from this. And my computationally distant, but linguistically and politically close reading of the text yielded to me an oppositional feature of Mitchell's language that went against almost all the other historiographic and therefore also political readings of the novel. Cloud Atlas constructs its historical imaginary of 19th century style through a reliance on a narrative of linguistic progress and improvement that contradicts its own meta-historical narrative. The computational approach gave me a reintegrative synthetic approach to distance and depth. So while then most people imagine computational methods to mean a move away from critical evaluative approaches, my work here actually gives me a way to reapproach literary value. This type of reading involves the success or otherwise of the novel's reality effects, as Barthes put it. And the question becomes one of whether this work succeeds in convincing us of its historical effects. You know, whether we should read the diary setting of this novel as realist, pastiche or parody, and with different success criteria mapped against each of those. So that's just my brief story of, of the ways that I've been using computational methods. Um, as Baz said, I've, I've also got a book out just in the last few weeks that aims to give more of a survey of this field and the things people are doing. But I guess I'll close just by saying that fundamentally computational methods are only as good as the questions that we ask of them and the uses to which we put them. Um, if we want computational methods to give us good results, we have to think about 
what kinds of question they can answer. So there's a there's a question of decomposition here, of breaking down what we want to know into bite-sized chunks, and then thinking whether or not it's better to answer that with a computer or to do it ourselves. I could have gone through Cloud Atlas and looked up every word in the dictionary and found these words that were anachronistic by hand. It would have taken me a very long time to do so, and it probably would not have been worth my time. But that's the kind of trade-off that we can have um, in terms of time, effort, payoff, reward, but only, as I said, if we think about what we're asking these methods to do. So thank you very much. I hope that was of interest. It was, Martin. It was just really fascinating. And uh, again, the kind of a, a hands-on kind of uh, depiction of what we can do, where the limits are. So it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, uh, I loved David Mitchell as well, um, and he is so into his language. So it's really interesting that you, you've been able to kind of, yeah, um, get beneath his skin, beneath his style, and really give us a new perspective on that. So um, I'm sure there will be some some more questions, and and I guess some more ideas that are kind of arising out of this session. Um, we kind of need to move towards the break. And what we thought we'd do um, is to uh, maybe do a bit of a, a hands-on exercise as well today. So what I'm hoping to do um, is to show you a bit how a particular tool works. Uh, it's called Voyant. And I've created uh, a corpus, a very small corpus. Uh, there's, I'm sending it in the chat now, I hope. Um, Four novels by Dickens and four novels by Virginia Woolf. Uh, and I'd like to invite you to use the software, uh, the Voyant software, to maybe just try it out. It's quite user friendly, it's intuitive. Um, and I'll just show you a, a bit of some things that I've been working on. Uh, although I must admit, I'm a novice looking at all the presentations that we have here today. Uh, so if you can download uh, the text that I'm putting in the uh, chat, that'd be great. I've cleaned them up so they, they're stripped of all paratext and all uh, like um, uh, four words afterwards, that type of thing. So, um, and I think I've set this in the email I sent to you last evening. We'll be using this website. It's called Voyant. So if you can open up that, um website that'd be great and what i want to do um is to kind of for you to explore uh, this particular tool it, it's very user friendly it's, it, it gives you the opportunity to visualize all sorts of linguistic features um i i know that some people know this they're much more advanced but i also know that some people may not know this uh, type of tool uh, and i thought it'd be a nice kind of hands-on interactive exercise to to maybe explore what we can do um so what i want to kind of ask you to do um is to upload one or more text onto the voyant tool i'll show you how to do it in a second but before we do that i think it's probably a good time um, to maybe stop and think about what questions you would want to ask. You, maybe you've written an essay or a book. Um, you've written uh, an essay on English literature recently. What do you think that a tool such as Voyant will be able to offer you? What would be, what, what would be beneficial in terms of using this software? I'll just show you a very rudimentary thing that, that I would um want to do uh, let me see um i'm going to show you how to how to how to upload the text as well so i'm going to try and share my screen again all right so i hope you can see my screen this is the voyant tool um you've got the box here it says open and upload here um, if you if you do open, it, it gives you automatic access to uh, corpora. Uh, I don't want to do that today. Uh, you can do this uh, if you want yourself. So if you open upload, um, I will then be led to my corpus that I'm, I'm doing here today. Uh, you can click on one text and upload it, or you can um, maybe think about uploading 
uh, all texts like that. Um, and then it will upload all the eight novels simultaneously. So you're smashing together all the words of those eight novels by Wolf and Dickens. So it's, it's uploading, uploading um, and it's doing its thing. I've already kind of prepared this. So um, I'll keep this going. It just takes always some time for the tool to do this. So um, this is Voyant uh, that I've used for Dickens's mutual friend. Okay, so text from uh, 1868. There's lots of things that the tool does. On, on the left-hand side, for instance, you see a word cloud um, with the, the top frequency of words represented, uh, and you can uh, move the scale. So um, you can do all sorts of tricks and understanding and visualize um, the presence and the frequency of words. So uh, it, it, I think that's it's really quite interesting. We've used it um, in some of our research. Um, on the right hand side, um, you've got um, uh, another tool, and I think what I've done with this one, yeah. So this is this is the um, version where I smash together all the eight novels, uh, put them together. And I, I did something that we've done before. So uh, we've been looking at the, 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 the uses of uh, um, words that refer to emotions. So uh, I've asked for disgust, fear, etc. So um, when you start off, um, it just has the, um, uh, the most frequent words in the corpus. But if you type in this box, if you type in a specific word, click on it and then it's added to the graph. Okay, so uh, you could do, let's say, fear, anger, et cetera. So, so what I'm kind of creating here um, is kind of a, an emotional graph of all those eight novels, okay? And what you can see is, is maybe quite interesting. I, I don't want to go into this in, in much detail. Um, I'll leave that for you to explore in a second. Um, you can, of course, also upload one, um, one text. So this is just uh, Dickens Mutual Friend. And uh, on the right-hand side, again, you can see the most frequent words and how they occur, how they are distributed across the text linearly. At the right-hand side, at the bottom, you've got another tool. And, uh, for instance, bubble lines uh, is, is quite interesting because it gives you the distribution of those words throughout the text. So kind of just as in the right top hand side, a um, uh, different version of that. So uh, I'd like to use this tool. So what you do is you click on uh, the terms that are most frequent and they, you can remove them. So I want them to be removed, um, getting rid of these. Um, and then at the bottom, you can fill in some words that you want to explore. So maybe you want to do like, a search into, let's say, gender. How is um, gender represented uh, in 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 the book, in the novel, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just a couple of the functions that we have on the left hand side. Um, it's probably I'll go back to the, the the tool with the eight novels. You can see the document length of all the eight novels that we have, the, the density, the average words per, per sentence. So um, you can see that Wolf's the Lighthouse um, has uh, long sentences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the lowest is Wolf's uh, The Years, which is kind of a late, no, uh, kind of a, one of the last novels that, that uh, Wolf wrote. So, these are some tools. Um, I think what I'd like to suggest, we, we have about sort of 15 minutes, including the break. Uh, I don't know, we probably need a break. Um, if you can use um, the tool, maybe upload one or more text or all eight text, whatever you want. Um, have a think about what you, what are the questions that you want to explore? Um, how does it connect with some of your your recent kind of uh, research. And, and we can uh, maybe explore that when we get back. So I'll stop sharing my screen. It's kind of over to you. Um, you've, got, you've got about um, 10, 15 minutes, make a cup of tea, 
cup of coffee, etc. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear um, what you make of the tool itself uh, and, and where you think the, the possibilities, opportunities are for uh, textual analysis. So I think we'll be back in about 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And then we can explore that uh, question. So see you in 10, 15 minutes. Okay, thank you.